The air was cool, almost cold, and smelled dank. Cassandra crunched sandy grit between her teeth and realized that her cheek was planted flat against the floor. She sat up and lifted her amethyst gaze from beneath her tousled hair to discern where she was. Light poured into the cellar through a small, solitary window. The four iron bars fastened in its stone sill were all that stood between her and freedom. She could tell it was out there, could hear the twittering songbirds and the wind rustled leaves on the other side. How had she come to be here? Her last memory was of toppling to her bedroom floor and crying out for Terracon. Between then and now, there was nothing. Echoes were too muffled to recall. Bright lights had blinded her to the distance. She had been seared numb to any trace of her travel. There were only stark contrasts between where she was and where she had been, and the most striking change was the golden cuffs which shackled her to a corbel in the wall. Cassandra examined the forked chain strung between her wrists and the wall. Her reflection was pinched and pulled over the curves of the polished gold loops. Cassandra fed the chain through her hands. Her rings tinkered against the interlocked links. She tried to pry the chains from the cuffs, a pair of golden van braces decorated with a relief of crescents, but bit her lip in frustration when she lacked the brute strength. It was no matter. Magic could crutch any falter. These manacles were physical objects, capable of suffering all sorts of imagined tortures, and her sarcastic and humiliating curses were sure to dissuade their ridiculously secure grip. Cassandra's palms blanched as she squeezed the links. She closed her eyes, doubted reality, and reimagined the situation. Cassandra knew the chains were breaking, would melt them with the heat of her frustration, could feel them quiver and rattle in fear of her fury. The chains did not break. The crushing force of will that Cassandra had been trained to exert on her environment failed even to shake the shackles. The loops of polished gold mocked her magic as much as they warped her reflection. Their restraint was as stubborn as she was. Not even her mother's schemes had been so successful in tying her down. This cannot happen, Cassandra balked. She clutched the bonds tighter. Her ears rang with a shattering crack. She clenched her eyes in fear that golden shrapnel might pierce her amethyst irises. Still the chains did not break. By definition, a witch could edit the creation of black magic. That her magic could not so much as shudder the chain, however, left Cassandra displaced. She felt abandoned in the body of some lesser being, and the pressure of her doubts began to fissure her composure. No, she would not surrender to evidence. Existence was compliant, not she, and her stubborn will would be obeyed. Cassandra resolved to tantrum. Instinctively, her hands gestured her demands. The cell flooded with her discontent. Frustrations flustered and chafed the situation until it ached to change. The cellar stayed plain as ever. There was neither flash nor blast, no warble or quake. There was not a single change that could be distinguished by any of her senses. Splotches of moss still clutched the mortar that dribbled between the masonry. The air neither warmed nor chilled. The birds outside the solitary window still twittered, giggled, and gossiped at her humiliating condition. Only the dust, which sparkled as it wafted in and out of the sun's beams, seemed affected by her flourish. It whisked out of the way of her fanned hand. Everything was now much more difficult. Even breathing, a rhythm which had been with her since birth, seemed alien and hard. She gasped, faster and faster, desperate to fight off the confusion in which she drowned. Where was she? Who was she? What was she? The grinding hiss of hinges distracted her attention toward a shadowy corner of her cell. The light from the window at which she had stared had burned a grated green glow into her eyes. And sensitized them to the static that danced in the darkness. She blinked repeatedly to better dredge details from the darkness. It was a voice, however, which she could first discern, a rasping pant as though someone were weary from towing a massive load. A figure waddled out of the darkness. Shadow slipped off its oily hide. It stepped into the beam, was backlit. Cassandra could discern almost nothing of its features, only that it wore a hooded coat of some kind. As it approached ever closer, the sour notes of its musk wafted with and nauseated the princess. Well, what have we here? 
the figure inquired between its throaty pants. A hearty welcome to you. It leaned in to leer at her with a single beady eye, which shone like copper foil against the shadows beneath its cowl. Cassandra inched back from its approach. Sensing her apprehension, it stayed itself a comfortable distance from her. Eventually, the silence between them became stale, and as it had yet to do anything actually offensive, Cassandra considered how to reply. Who are you, and why am I here? It groaned with disappointment. For being a princess, I had expected you to at least entertain my formalities. Cassandra could not get herself to apologize. Well then, the stranger huffed impatiently, I guess it is straight to introductions. I am Marco, he trilled, Lord of the Trolls. Why have you brought me here? Cassandra demanded. I? It was not I. I would not have wasted my time, he snorted with insult. There must be a multitude of alternatives to keeping you here in this bleak ruin of ancient Hexen architecture. He waved his hand to draw her attention to the cellar. Sedwa, however. That name flickered in her mind like a wet tongue in her ear, but she could not place it. Sedwa was intent on having you as a guest. So it was Sedwa's poem that brought me here? Why is she not here? Why am I being held here? Cassandra's irritation swelled with each question. Quiet witch, Marco bleated exhaustedly. Sedwa did not write the poem. Sedwa could not write the poem, Marco prodded Cassandra with his curved black claw after each remark. She is too prosaic, too impatient to be so creative. The author of the poem is I. The charm itself was hers. Stop being so distracted by the details and let us focus on the fact that your ignorant and impudent self is here. He did little to mask his emotions. Cassandra was distracted from his rant by the growing fervor with which his thick, conical tail whipped the ground. Now I only came down this morning to see if there had been any progress through the night. You made it, said what well, will be happy, and unless there is anything I can do to accommodate you, I will be off. Accommodate me? Marco had started to waddle off, but turned back. What? What do you think I'm going to do to you? Marco inched in toward her again, this time pressing closer even when Cassandra was pinned to the wall. Do you think I'm going to poke you? He prodded. Push you? He motioned. Do you think I'm going to break your bones and rend your meat and eat you alive? The light from the window coursed over new features as he stepped ever closer. The hairs of his hide were highlighted as streaks. He had to turn his head to leer into her with a single beady, brazen eye and... From his profile, she could at last distinguish the jutting tusks that flanked his upturned snout. There was a translucence to those fangs, which almost made them glow when backlit. The stench, however, was what drove her to raise the butt of her palm defensively and defiantly against him. He wafted with a perfume of wet hair and spoiled soil, like freshly upturned compost. Marco's mere presence was an affront to her, one she could not bear and demanded be removed. She did not want to touch those boorish features, and it was better to beat them back than endure them. Marco squealed as he tumbled back across the cell's packed dirt floor. Landing the punch fueled Cassandra's fight. She dove forward, intent on tearing the troll apart. Her lunge strained the chains, but they would not accommodate her with the distance she needed. She was, instead, suspended halfway through her pounce, far shy of her target, who was coiled, fetal, and whimpering on the floor. Let me go, Cassandra snarled like the chains. Then never again dare approach me, you putrid monster. The troll's thick conical tail coiled itself under the dark cloak as Marco drew himself up on his cloven hooves. He turned toward the princess's restrained flurry of scratching nails. His bestial features twisted first with fury, then with mocking. With a violent whip back of his cape, he pulled from his breast a hexagonal red gem clasped in a gold setting and strung around his neck by a thick chain. He lifted the amulet, aimed it at Cassandra, then barked. Back! 
The air fizzed and cracked as cyan threads of electricity coiled around the crimson solitaire. Cassandra shuddered from the scalding swells that poured over her. Her hands lifted in defiance, usually enough to deflect any pain. The burn did not end, however. The bleak cell was washed with bright light. The clap of thunder was deafening. The blinding lights drained back into the jewel, and the details of the cell were surrendered back to the darkness. Cassandra was not sure what hurt more, the crack of the bolt as it slapped against her face or the blunt shock of her skull as it crashed into the stone wall behind her. The ringing in her ears faded almost as if into the distance until the ambient chirps of songbirds and the whisk of breezes could again be discerned. Cassandra then heard Marco bleat with amusement. Oh, my predictable dearest, I am afraid I forgot to introduce you to what makes me brute among trolls. You see, I relish in antiquities. This little trinket, he swung his gold-set red gem in her face before replacing it to his breast. Well, think of it as the less eloquent means by which I can express myself. And if your inquisitive, if feeble mind is stunned by your inability to rebut my assertiveness, then I invite you to contemplate the nature of your restraints. Those cuffs once chained the demon Orkhan. I am sure you are aware of their significance. Now, my pet, Marco began to pace in a slow rhythm back and forth before her. I have no doubts that you are in an uncomfortable situation with no hope for improvement and not wanting to waste suffering on someone who cannot appreciate it. I will offer this brief overview and solution. To be clear, I have no blatantly malignant feelings toward witches. There is, however, an unfortunate, out-of-control matter between us. I am convinced that the pixie's handling of the matter would be more advantageous to me. Thusly, I have made allies out of these most disagreeable of partners, and I will aid them however I can in obtaining from you the divine right of black magic. What? Cassandra could not begin to keep up. I will leave you in peace now to meditate on the means by which you will relinquish your magical inheritance. You want to take black magic from me? But if you choose to selfishly maintain your possession of black magic, then the fairies and I will interpret your gestures as an act of war and will respond accordingly. No! No need to answer now, Marco deflected as he made his way to the door. I will return later to discuss it further. The door squealed shut behind him. Cassandra was closed off again, with only the mocking chirps of songbirds to soothe her. Wait! The lock dropped shut and sealed Cassandra in with the lonesome darkness. A priest held a pearl pendant on a golden chain. His emerald eyes ticked back and forth with the pendulum's swing. His sandaled feet padded softly in the same rhythm as its sway. It lured him ever closer towards something he could not yet define, but understood could be the only clue to finding the princess. He needed his interpretation of its movement to be accurate, so he kept his face averted, afraid that his breath might disturb its momentum. The rest of the room was being rummaged through by a small group of curates who were in a marvelous standing with the Hierophant. Hinges creaked as the contents of the window boxes were revealed. Drawers squealed out to reveal what had been shoved away. Fingers, foraging for clues amid the forest of glass perfume vials, created a distracting clatter. Every noisy occupation was interrupted, however, when the door's iron hinges squealed open to announce Nesu's arrival. The slumber he had fought against all night had left his eyes bruised blue and baggy. Have you found anything yet? He snapped bitterly worn. The priest with the emerald eyes abandoned his study of the pendulum to answer. I am afraid not much, Lord Nesu. He stashed the pearl solitaire in a pocket of his brocade jacket and led Nesu to a single arched window which punctured the wall opposite the princess's bed. There is soil scattered on the sill, likely fairy dust that has cooled. Unfortunately, Terracon's attempt to break in has blown ash everywhere. The priest waved his hand to present the charred wood that spilled from the doorway and made discerning the trail impossible. Perhaps something here, your excellency, another curate offered and held up a small scrap of paper. Nesu snatched the scrap and examined it closely. Singe outlined the narrow strip of blue paper. The shred was scratched with black ink, but the only legible portion read, Never knew. 
Is there any more of this? Nesu wheeled back to beg. The acolyte had come to stand precariously balanced on tiptoe to glean a better glance over the vizier's shoulder. Caught off guard by Nesu's turn, the acolyte tripped backward. Her hands snatched for any brace. Finding none, she fell. Arms tensed rigid in fear of the impact. Eyes winced against the inevitable pain. Muscles clenched until the curate was skinny enough to fall between the bed and the nightstand. Sheets were dragged off of the bed to pillow her crash. The nightstand tumbled over, out of the way. The pitcher inside the bedside cupboard shattered. Water drooled between the tiles and soaked into the bedspread. Sherds of glazed ceramic were scattered across the floor. With a great fuss, the fallen acolyte was offered assistance in standing again. But these efforts grew distracted when a single domed sherd from the pitcher's belly was dramatically lifted by a pair of emaciated azure arms. The inky eyes of the fairy, once hidden in the nightstand, rippled with fear. Its tiny head twitched back and forth, taking in the panorama of gawking witches. Get it! Nesu howled. The fairy blasted into the air on a stream of periwinkle glitter. The gossamer wings flickered to catch a breeze, but were tripped in their ascent by the winds whistled up by the witch who had been rummaging through Cassandra's chest. Wayward blows could not distract the gossamer's sail for long, however, and the sprite quickly adjusted to the superficial gusts. Hands lashed to swat the fairy from the air, or clap it shut between two palms, but the fairy careened with too much agility to be caught. Then Nesu slammed the door shut. The squealing iron resonated the air enough to crack the panes of translucent film framed in the veins of the fairy's wings. The gossamer burst like bubbles, and the twitching skeletal blue body dropped to the vanity. An empty chalice was dropped over the sprite by a quick-witted priestess who concentrated the whole weight of her body into keeping the cup from being carried off by the captured fairy's panicked efforts to escape. Bring me a fairy ball, Nesu ordered. The curate who had fallen dashed from the room and returned only moments later with five iron knives and a globe of intricately woven iron strips. She laid the knives on the table and handed the sphere to Nesu. The vizier plucked at the iron strands to loosen the weave and form a wide gap. Now, just as we practiced, Nesu reminded them. The curates took the iron knives and positioned the blades around the overturned brim. The chalice was slowly lifted. The last knife was thrust to pin the sprite down. Nesu placed the ball of iron strips where the cup had been. The knives were retracted in turn. The last was used to prod the fairy into the orb of woven iron. Careful not to let the sprite out, Nesu slid the iron slivers back into place. When at last sealed, Nesu lifted the fairy ball from the dressing table's marble top. The light of the sprite was bound by the bands of iron, and dappled shadows were cast across the faces of the hovering clergy. Well done, my children, Nesu congratulated, beaming a smile even brighter than the fairy's glow. He rolled the iron orb in his hand. Notice how, even without full wings, it still maintains some capacity for suspension? Through the eyelets, the curates watched the sprite paddle and swim away from the encapsulating metal. And remember, it is not the shape of this tool that limits the fairy's movements, as its body is not restrained by physics. Rather, the restraint is a side effect of the iron. They studied the fairy for a while longer, but eventually the excitement of the accomplishment was overtaken by an anxiety about next steps. I will be interrogating this prisoner. Continue searching for any other clues. I will have more fairy balls brought up in case they are needed.